Becky Davidson. I'm from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I'm going to talk about tapering systemic med medication. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, describing to you a 12-year-old boy who came to see me for a second opinion back in 2013. He'd already been treated for parsonitis. He had bilateral vitrectomy. He was on adalimumab. He was on, on diflopredinate um, six times a day in the right eye, three times in the day in the left eye. Despite all this, his visual acuity was 2250 in the right eye, 2050 in the left eye. He had four plus vitreous cell. Um, one plus uh, cell in the, in the left eye. He had the, um, an epiretinal membrane. It's kind of hard to see on the, on the optic, but he had a thick epiretinal membrane on the, on the right eye. Um, and here's his OCT, uh, loss of macular edema, better view of the epiretinal membranes. And we put him on uh, infliximab. Uh, he, this is a child who we also gave some solumedrol, both boluses of his first two infliximab infusions, as well as sub-Q methotrexate weekly. Um, after nine months of the therapy, we were able to get him off of all steroids. Um, his vision had improved to 2050 in the right eye and 2025 in the left eye, and he stayed on this therapy for two years. So he was, he was steroid-free for two years, steroid-free for two years, which led us to the thoughts of, is it, is it time to taper? And so I think of tapering as the who, what, when, how of, of, of practice. So who are the candidates for uh, tapering, and what or which medicine do you choose to start with? when is the right time to attempt to taper, and how do you monitor patients when they're tapering. So who are the candidates to taper? Well, doesn't everybody deserve a chance to see if they still need medicine? Um, I think you, it, I, I believe that, but I'm definitely more reluctant in patients that have sick eyes. So if they have bad glaucoma, if they have a lot of Lister sneak if they're hypotenuse, if one uveitis flare will cause vision loss, that might not be a patient that you want to taper. Um, maybe they've already been tapering because two years ago they were smaller kids. Now they're, they're, they've gained weight and they're at lower doses uh, per kilogram than when you originally started. Um, they have to have been quiet. No recurrence of the uveitis on their current therapy for one to two years, but uh, I think most of us believe two years and that's in keeping with what um, Ashley just mentioned from the rheumatology recommendations. And then no use of steroids in that time frame too. So the clock starts when the patients discontinue their steroids, not when they start the systemic agent. So for my, my case that I just presented to you, it took us nine months to get him off the steroids. So his clock, he was, when we were having this tapering conversation, it was really almost three years from the time that I had met him. Um, and which medicine do you choose? So if they're on monotherapy, that's easy. Um, if they're a combined therapy, most patients on combined therapy, it's methotrexate and TNF inhibitors. Uh, one question to ask yourself is on their methotrexate, are they on antibody prevention doses or they are, are they on therapeutic doses of methotrexate? So everybody who's on, on infliximab needs to be on methotrexate to prevent um, antibody formation unless you're gonna use solumedrol like um, Jenny was describing before. And so it just might be helpful for you to get used to the, the, the doses. So if they're on 25 milligrams of methotrexate, that's a, that's a treatment dose. But if they're on seven and a half or 10 milligrams of methotrexate, that's probably more what we call HACA dosing. Um, and so you, if, if they're on a, a treatment dose, maybe you can um, reduce it to HACA dosing. Um, and then in thinking about it, you know, one, one, one perspective is if they're on the TNF inhibitor because they originally were on the methotrexate and it didn't provide control, then maybe that's a reason to reduce the methotrexate dose first, but I think people could, could argue the flip side too. So when you're tapering methotrexate, uh, you can reduce the dose. Um, if they're on sub-Q, maybe that's an opportunity to change them to the oral methotrexate uh, and see if the disease stays as well controlled. Uh, tapering TNF inhibitors. So if, we, if you're tapering infliximab, you can reduce the, the dose or you can reduce the frequency. Um, because it requires infusions every four weeks, coming to the hospital, missing school, missing work, most patients want it just, you, it's a smarter choice to reduce the frequency. We would typically transition to every six weeks, and then we would give patients three infusions of six weeks, verifying that they're controlled on six weeks before we would attempt to further spate. Then we would attempt to go to eight week intervals, and if they're again quiet on three eight week intervals, that might be a time to attempt to discontinue the medicine altogether. Now, I just want to point out that to, it's extremely critical to examine the patients as close to the infusion as possible. I try to see them on the same day um, because when they're at their medication trough, you want them um, to be com completely quiet and not, not have, a, have a flare. If you see them two weeks before they're about to get the infusion, then that's really four weeks of what they've been on that therapy anyway. Um, Adalimumab, Humira, not everybody tapers it. Uh, if you have a patient who was on it weekly, then you go to biweekly. Um, biweekly is the standard dosing. 
Um, some people go to every three weeks, some people just discontinue it. So when do you consider this? It's, I think it's important to, to reiterate what, what's already been said, that two years of not having a recurrence of uveitis, and again, that the clock starts when they've discontinued steroids. But also things to consider is if it's a patient, um, if they stop their systemic and they flare, that's gonna require them to come back to your office much more frequently. And so there might be better times for kids to risk flaring than others. If they don't wanna miss school and they'd rather flare, have a, um, come off med in the summer, that's worth doing. But some kids go to summer camp, some kids go visit grandparents in Arizona for the summer. So that you have to just have that open conversation with, with patients and say, when's the best time for you to risk a flare? And then how to monitor them. So methotrexate can really stay in your system for a good two to three months. So if they stop, meth if they make a change to their methotrexate and you see them back in four weeks, it's probably too soon to see whether they're flying without the methotrexate on board. So you really wanna see them in two to three months after making a change. Uh, with the infliximab, like I mentioned, that you wanna see them right as close to the, the trough of medicine in their, in their system. And adalimumab, uh, maybe after missing two doses, so four to six weeks after making a change is a good time to see them. Uh, Special considerations for patients with pars colonitis that um, maybe you want to use uh, a OCT to look for CME or a repeating IVFA to, to make sure they're quiet, which brings me back to my patient. So we decided to um, decrease his infliximab frequency. Um, he remained on the 25 milligrams of sub-Q methotrexate and we made it to every eight weeks and clinically he looked quiet. And we had him have an, have an FA. At the time, we don't have an FA at, at the Children's Hospital, so he went over to, to the adult specialist. And I just heard back from, from the retina specialist, looks good, inactive disease, go ahead and stop Remicade. And I didn't review the images myself. And we stopped the infliximab, and 16 weeks after being off, off, off infliximab, he, he uh, flared, and we restarted medicine, and fortunately, he was uh, recaptured. But then I was able later in time to pull up the images and maybe he really wasn't so quiet after all. You know, he's got a hot disc, he's got a little leakage. And if I saw this, these images and he was staying on medicine and clinically he was quiet, I don't think I'd say, wow, we have to escalate therapy. But seeing that, and that doesn't give me a lot of confidence that he would do well without therapy. Um, so uh, the reality, uh, most of the time, or it feels like every time we try to stop uh, uh, especially the, the biologic that everybody recurs. It just it really seems like that. Um, I've had a child who was off methotrexate and Humira for two years and it came back. And that was great that she got to stay off meds for two years. Um, when, it, when she recurred, we put her back on Humira and it didn't work and now she's on Remicade. So, you know, do attempts at stopping, stopping, um, stopping medicine risk and body formation. Something to ask yourself. Um, is there a different criteria for maybe having a longer period of time for more, longer than two years for really little kids. So a two-year-old who shows up with JIA and her very first eye exam, she had uveitis. You get her quiet, so now she's four and still um, is likely to be in an active phase of, of arthritis and uveitis. And maybe she, she's really just likely to, to, um, to, to flare when you discontinue. So maybe they should, we should wait longer for those kids. Um, and then again, should we not even try on patients that uh, are at high risk for vision loss, but discontinue with another uveitis flare. So there's no randomized controlled trial on stopping uh, immunomodulators, except that there is one beginning now. Uh, it's being a, the, the um, multinational uh, study being um, led by Nisha Acharya here at, at Proctor, um, and it's it's called the ADJUST trial, uh, Adalimumab and Juvenile Idiopathic Arthritis Associated Uveitis Stopping Trial. So. Patients are gonna be, it's, it's for patients who have been on, um, on Humira for uh, one to two years and you're ready to stop and, um, and they're gonna get randomized to either placebo or medicine. So you're sort of trying to stop, but you maybe you'll still be on medicine. And it's, it's um, listed on clinicaltrials.gov here and so we'll see what information we get. Developed antibodies after you tried to take her off, or well, just after one, being on for a while. One time, her mother took her off. The other time, they were tapering her down to rheumatology, and then they 
decided to go back up and she had huge symptoms from the institution. So, I mean, is there an answer to that? Should we just leave those people on it if they don't think it's working? Uh, Dr. Cooper and I, um, starting, I remember three or four years ago, we had a number of kids that we drew, couldn't recapture control no matter what we did after having tapered people or stopped. And so we stopped stopping. And now when you come to our clinic and we put you on uh, systemic medicines, we say, until we have better data and we know more, don't plan to stop your medicine. Like, it's not in our plan anymore. Um, I've had some good, for uh, some of the patients that had infusion reactions because they uh, uh, developed um, antibodies to infliximab, we've had some good success on uh, Symphony, Bilimimimab, uh, which is difficult to obtain through the insurance, although the form will help. Um, but that, that could also be, that's, that's another next step that could be considered for your patient. What age do you try to make the findings and burn out? Dr. Cooper, if you're not considered the tummy, like cell family, do you want to make your own body count? Not always, maybe like, possibly maybe 20%. what I've experienced. I mean, these kids are going to college. Um, and I think our, our struggle is long, knowing that the 